Hey everybody, I'm Dale, I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Dale. I don't know what to think about that introduction, you know. Uh, he passed up a pair of Johnston Murphys over there, just to the size too. Nine Charlie. <laughs> um, <clears throat> that was the most interesting store I've been in in a while, and I thought it was just some lady that had a store over there and had a bunch of used clothes, and you went over there, and she said that they had 21 stores. Fee-fees. Go figure. <laughs> well, you know, that's probably the most important thing I'll say tonight is I'm Dale and I'm an alcoholic. And, uh, and I come from a long line of alcoholics. Uh, my father was an alcoholic. You know, I went and spoke one time at a, a little gathering one weekend, you know, and uh, Dave Cook was there. And uh, we were riding over to the ice cream parlor after, we'd, after the speaker had talked. And uh, we're riding over there. I said, Dave, I said, how long have you been around here? He said, 50 something years. I said, well, you might have known my daddy. And uh, I said, did you know my daddy? And uh, he said, oh, hell yeah, I knew him. He said, I knew him the first time he came in and the second time he came in. <laughs> I said, what do you mean the first and the second? He said, well, he came in one time, stayed about six months, didn't like it, found it unwanting, and left for 10 years and came back. So he came in when he was 47, went back out, came back in when he was 57. And uh, then he stayed 20, 22 years, he died sober. And, uh, and I came in here and um, I was sentenced here by the judge. He said, you gotta go to 20 meetings. And that was quite overbearing, really overbearing. <laughs> you know, two, three meetings is enough for anybody. And, um, <laughs> And so, so I went to the meeting, sat on the back row, tried to just come, you know, just incognito, you know, on the back row. And every meeting they'd say, are there any new people here, you know? And I'd look all around, and everybody turned around and look at me. I felt like they were looking at me, and I'd raise my hand. I'd say, yeah, I'm Dale, and I'm checking it out. <laughs> uh, and they say, welcome, Dale. And I'd say, yeah, they're pretty nice sword. And that's how my first meeting went, coming in here. Um, I was 47 at the time, and I knew my daddy had quit when he was 57. And uh, I said, well, I might be 10 years smarter than my daddy. <laughs> and, I mean, you just don't know what goes on in an alcoholic's head. Uh, I got here first, that kind of thing, and then, uh, and then my daughter came along and, uh, and she's a member of AA now, but, uh, but she came when she was 30. So she's 17 years smarter than I am, you know? Um, this year on July the 1st, my daughter will have 13 years in here, you know? And that's really, really good. Uh, she wouldn't tell me about it for the first year and a half. You know, she was sober a year and a half before she ever told me. And I asked her one time when we were all having dinner, I said, why, why, why didn't you tell me? You know, why, how come you didn't tell me? You know, we're brothers in the hood. You know what I mean? I mean, we in AA. You know? She says, well, I didn't know whether I was going to stay or not. And uh, I might would have gone back out, and I just kind of didn't want you to micromanage me. You know? I'd kind of been her daddy all her life, you know, and she was kind of doing this for her and her own deal, you know? And so I've learned a lot from my daughter, and I've learned a lot from all you people here in AA. And... Uh, there's a lot of familiar faces here. Um, I could have never done it without you. Um, my home group is Beginners and Winners. We meet every Thursday night at the Wrightsville United Methodist Church down in Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina. My sobriety date is March 18th of 1991. And uh, that's a record for me. I've been in a month longer than my daddy had. And I was just coming in here to check it out. And now I've been here 22 years and two months. Ain't that something? Who'd have thought it? When I came in here, I was just going to check it out. You know, I had no idea I was coming here. You know, um, I started off drinking when I was like 15, 16 years old. And, uh, and what I would do is, what I'd do is I'd get a, a pint, and it might would last me for like three weekends or four. You know, getting, getting high one night a weekend. Beer, I could hardly get to stay down. 
And I remember I drank beers at first, and I would get sick, and I'd throw them back up. And I'd say, man, I ain't never going to fit in with this crowd. And see, they're the ones I like, those hip, slick, and cool guys that got high, hung around the pool hall, you know, that kind of stuff. And so um, finally, one night, three of us, we'd gotten together, and we made up some fake ID cards. You know, we split those. This is back when they had a draft. They had, everybody had draft cards. This was in the old ages. <laughs> and I split one of those cards open, put some ink eradicate on my birthday on you know, it, and it just went away like magic. That day, and I hit, put it in a typewriter and hit it once, and I was automatically 18. I said, man, this is great. I put that thing back together with a little glue around the edges, you know, and we went to the Crossroads Tavern on Hillsborough Street in Raleigh. That's where I was born and raised, in Raleigh, North Carolina. And um, I got into the Crossroads Tavern, and I walked in there, and I pulled that card out, and it had written on the back of it, you know, severe penalty for alterations and all this stuff written on the back of that card. And I said, my God, I sure hope the feds don't get me. <laughs> Here I am, a 16-year-old kid, you know, trying to get a beer, and I'm worried about the feds. <laughs> and, and I threw that card out there, and that big gruff fellow that, that ran the Crossroads Tavern, he picked up that card and says, ha, you barely made it, man. You're good. Next. And I got to thinking to myself, I'm in. I'm in. And then I got to thinking, my next thought was, am I going to get sick inside of this man's place? Because I wasn't doing good with the beers, you know. And, um, and the reason I'm going so much detail on this is because this is what sold me on drinking. I went in there and there was people in there and they were laughing. There was women sitting at the bar and women over here and everything. And I liked them too, you know. I liked the beer and them. And, um, and so we went back there and sat in the corner and I drank some Bach, what they call Bach beer. It's dark beer. It ain't gold looking. It's kind of brown looking. And I said, maybe this will be different. And I took a swig of that. It was pretty good. Pulled on down about a half a glass of it. I said, mm, so far so good. I was real near the bathroom. I was about as far from here to Wallace to the bathroom. But I wanted to be able to break and run if I had to. And it went down good. I poured a second glass like I'd been drinking all my life. Pulled about half of that down, and you know that feeling you get? It hit my stomach down there, and boom. All of a sudden, my ears started getting hot. And I was feeling myself. And everything, I said, man, this is what they've been talking about, you know? I said, man, I'm feeling kind of good. I said, I'm going to go in the bathroom and take a look at myself and see what I look like. I was feeling so different. So, so I got up and went into the bathroom, locked the door behind me. I got in there and looked and everything. And checked myself all out and everything. Yeah, you're looking pretty good, man. You're feeling good too, ain't you, you know? I had that euphoria going on that you get, boy, when you get that first drink and boom, it goes back to your ears and your brain. Up there, I come out that door a new man. Right off, I could tell the women were looking at me. They all wanted to dance with me. I was 10 foot tall. I was bulletproof. Um, knew everything. I went up to the front bar up there, and I, that big hairy guy that I was scared of when I came in with that card, I said, hey, Come on over here. I mean, I was the kind of drunk that would get high and take over, you know. So I went, um, he came down there and I said, I got a joke I want to tell you. I told him some old corny joke. He slapped the bar and he laughed and I laughed and I said, man, I have finally found me a bunch that I'm going to be with the rest of my days. You know, felt good. Man. All the girls were looking at you. I mean, why in the hell would somebody want to quit drinking? You know? I made up my mind that night. I said, I'm going to do this every time I get a chance till I die. You know? I had no idea about any progression. No idea of any of that stuff. And, 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 uh, and <clears throat> that's the way I pursued life. And uh, I must tell you that later on that night, about 11.30, quarter to 12, I was up the road just a little bit, and I laid down in the churchyard to take a nap. And a um, short nap, need one every now and then. 
And I laid down taking a nap, and somebody came over and shook my foot. And my eyes did like this. And, and, they, and the, they were concerned people. And they said, are you all right, son? Are you all right? I, I said, yeah, I'm fine. I'm just, just uh, taking a nap. <laughs> and they said, yeah, yeah. I said, uh, we were just concerned about you. And I said, yeah. I said, that's, that's, thanks for checking on me, you know. And that, that was as good as my drinking was to get, you know. You get that euphoric feeling, and then I'd overshoot it. And then I'd land up sleeping in the yard or going to jail or, or some stuff like that, you know. And so that, that was what I pursued, and I did that for 31 years. I tried every way I could try to change it around, you know. I tried uh, drinking two tablespoons full of melted butter and stuff like that before I went out. And I, I mean, I tried everything to figure out how to drink right without going over, you know, by overshooting it. My perfect drinking night would be to start off drinking and come, come on up there and just get that good buzz going and then level off and then go right straight with it, like that. I could never do it. I always overshot it. <laughs> Y'all have trouble with overshooting. Mm. So, um... It's been, a, uh, it's been a real good experience uh, being in AA. Um, I continued drinking, went into the service, pulled four years into service, uh, came out with no driving license and two DUIs. Um, so I was 21 years old. I'd come out of the service, had two DUIs, and, um, and I was later to get five more. You know, over the next 31 years, I got five. So I had like seven DUIs over my drinking career. Now, years ago, you didn't get in any trouble with them. You know, they'd say, hey, you look like you've had a little too much to drink. Uh, look at your, is that your girlfriend over there? Yeah, 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 she ain't drank as much as I have. Well, let her drive. And they'd move you over and let her drive. You know, they just make you swap drivers and go head on. You know, and then lately, over the last... 20, 25 years, you know what I mean? They just carry you to the hoose cow. And you've got to go to jail. And, um, and, and it just continued to get worse at the end of my drinking. Uh, at the end of my drinking, that's the way it was with me. I'd been to several of them. If I did not get convicted, then they were wrong. That didn't count. Oh, yeah, I had a DUI, but they reduced it to reckless driving. And, uh, and that don't count. And, uh, and, and I made excuses all the time. So what finally happened to me was um, I went, I was in the car business all my life. And uh, I sold Chevrolets. And I worked at the Chevrolet place down there. It's Jeff Gordon now. It was Tom Wright back in the day on College Road in Wilmington. And, um, and I'd just been in the car business so long, I, I couldn't do without a license in the car business. So I would go to any lengths to get out of a DUI. If I got a DUI, I'd do anything to get out of it. You know, uh, I had temporary licenses working there and all that stuff. But this final DUI that I got that put me over the hump was the one that really, really set me down. Uh, I went and played golf one day with some of the other dealers uh, around town, and there was uh, four or five or six of us, and we went down to the Cape, down toward Carolina Beach on 421, and they had an 18-hole course down there, and we played that course uh, twice down that day. Um, every time we'd come around by the house over there, we'd get another case of beer and put it in a cooler, and we'd go around, you know. And we weren't drinking real bad. There was no liquor drinking. We were just drinking beer. And um, we drink like maybe one a whole, something like that, you know, <laughs> social. And, um, and, when we, and when we got back, we were doing pretty good, you know, because we was exercising out there, walking and stuff, and, you know, swinging at the golf balls and drinking beer. So we come back there, and we, I, I remember I, pulled, I was pulling out the cape, and I said, I can go to left here and go on back up to Wilmington and go home. Or I can go right and go down here and see some of my buddies down here at the, at the pier, down the uh, fishing pier down at Carolina Beach. They had the charter boats and all that. And I knew most of them guys because I did a lot of that fishing too. So I said, I think I'll go down there and just visit around some. So I went down there and they had a restaurant down there called the Sunset Lounge. 
Some of y'all might have heard of it before, been there. But it's right on the water at Carolina Beach, right where the charter boats are. And I walked in there and I told them, I said, uh, I looked around, there was about six, eight people in there, and I said, the drink's on me, man. Your money ain't no good when Dale's here. So you know how I was feeling. <laughs> <laughs> I went on it. You don't ever do that if you got over six, eight, or ten, you know. If you do it, you don't do it long. <laughs> but I went in there and I, I did my big shot thing. And uh, in there, we sat and we drank those beers and everything. And I remember one of those people that I was buying beers for, I was in the restroom. He came down, you want me to drive you back home? And I hadn't been down there long. And I'm thinking, damn, I ain't ready to go. Said, Hell, he's wanting to drive me home. I must be worse than I think I am. No, I'm in good shape. I'm going to go ahead and go while I'm in good shape. And so I left out of there in a blackout. Paid the bill, left out of there in a, in a blackout. And I wasn't going to leave my car nowhere, so I took my car with me. And um, I won't leave it nowhere and have nobody send me home on no cab. So anyway, I got in the car and I drive up there and I make it all the way to Wilmington. On Oleander Drive, I'm near about there. You know, I'm about three or four miles from the house. I'm on a four-lane road. Everything's good. Except I didn't see that car that had stopped in front of me. And he was taking a left going into the... Um, this, uh, Tasty Freeze ice cream parlor. Him and his wife and two kids. And this was Sunday night, you know, about 9 o'clock, 8.30, 9 o'clock on Sunday night. You know, and they're acting like people are supposed to act. You know, they've probably been to church, had the kids out, went to dinner. Let's go get ice cream like that. And then here I come, see, through there. <laughs> Didn't even see them. Hit the van in the rear. It totally lost both cars. Turned his vehicle over in the road. They climbed out of there. They were okay. Uh, skin a little bit in one or two places. But um, what I had done was I would have gone through the windshield except the steering wheel kept me from going through the windshield. But I crushed my sternum, and I had 19 stitches up here, and I was just I was clean out of it. Well, the paramedics got there, and they said, we think he's dead in the car. And uh, the guy that owns Flip's Barbecue right there said, no, no, I've seen him worse than that in Vietnam. I said, let's pull him out of that. You know? <laughs> so they pulled me out, and I was dead all right. I was dead drunk. <laughs> you know? I mean, I looked kind of dead because I was bleeding so bad. And so um, they put me on there and hauled me over to the hospital. I never will forget, I opened up my eyes over there at that hospital, and they were crackling. You know, they opened your eyes up, and they were crackling. I was new to me, too. I opened up, they were cracking up. What is this? Where am I? I didn't know where I was. You know, that blackout driving. And um, I heard one of the nurses say, he's awake. He's awake. And what they should have said, he's come to. He's come to. You know? But, you know, they were normal people, and I wasn't. I just don't know how to drink. So um, I wake up, I said, where am I? I said, you, and he said, you've been in a car accident. And I said, who ran into me? Uh, we don't know anything about that, but there's a highway patrolman outside. And I said, uh-oh. Well, I knew I'd been drinking all day. And uh, he'd already took a blood sample. The nurse had and everything. You know, that was already done, you know. So my wife came in and I said, Betty, you have got to go call our attorney and get this under control. She said she walked out of there just dizzy, under control. Just exactly what does he want me to do? I mean, what am I going to get under control? You know, it's uh, 12 or 1 o'clock in the morning on, uh, on Monday morning, and here I am in a trauma unit, and I'm telling her to get things under control. You know, so she went home and called up the lawyer, and the lawyer said, hey, uh, we can't do anything but damage control for him. Said they're going to hang him. That was bad news. So anyway, after two days, I got out of there. Um, I, was, I had tubes and everything. I didn't have to get out of bed to go to the restroom or anything. You know, they had me wired. And uh, by the end of the first day, I was standing up with all the wires hanging from me. And I'd walk about two feet this way and two feet that way, and they figured I could get on out of there since I was doing that good. So they put me back in the bed and disconnected everything and, and, and discharged me. And the doctor met with me, says, you got 19 stitches in your head, so it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a lot of pain. You've got a crushed sternum, so we x-rayed it. So you're gonna have a lot of pain. 
And uh, he said, I want you to take this right here for the pain. If it gets too bad, take it. And I said, okay. And so um, I went home. The crackling that was in my eyes, I had to wash out, was blood. They had to pour it down in my eyes, and they couldn't clean my eyes out. And so I just laid there with them closed until it dried. Then when I tried to open it, it would crackle. You know? So I go home, and I clean up, and I'm laying in the bed, and I'm drinking grape juice, and I'm trying to get over this hangover, and I got this bandage on my head that looks like I've been in a war or something. And uh, you know what I was thinking about? Well, I'll be glad when I get through this mess right here so I can go out and drink like a gentleman. I'm not going to drink no more like I did this last time. I made up my mind. I mean, I had to talk with myself. I'm not going to do this anymore. <laughs> and uh, I would talk that stuff, and then I would believe it. You know, I really thought I could do something. And uh, you guys are the ones that saved me. Um, when the judge sent me here, you know, I had to hear, hey, it's getting worse. It's going to continue to get worse. If you go out and drink so much, one more beer is going to continue to get worse. <coughs> no? So what do you want to do? Do you want to keep on going to the bitter end? To maybe you don't get out of a trauma unit? Or do you want to just stop now and start you on the trail up? Or do you want to keep going down? What do you want to do, Dale? And, of course, I was smarter than y'all. At first I decided, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check y'all out. I'll just check y'all out. So I went for 20 meetings, and um, there's a lady down there that's real good in, uh, she, in helping people in AA. Her name is uh, Jana L. And um, she elbowed me one Sunday morning. It was on my 22nd meeting. I already had my paper signed to get my license back. But I, I had come back to two meetings after I didn't have to. So my mind was thinking, you know, they're not a bad sort. Nobody here called me an alcoholic. I knew I had trouble, but nobody called me an alcoholic. And they pat me on the back and tell me to keep coming back. Every day they tell me, hey, damn, man, I like what you said. Keep coming back. And I figured that y'all needed me here, you know? <laughs> you know? Which you got to have newcomers to work on, you know? And, um, and so I got thinking, well, you know, I'll try a few of these meetings on my own. I'm not one to be told what to do and, and follow directions good. I just don't do it. So I came back uh, anyway, and I picked up a white chip after going to like 21 or two or three meetings. And I picked up a white chip. Everybody clapped, and that's the best I ever felt. But you know what I felt that was really? I felt like a load came off my shoulders. I didn't have to worry about this anymore. If I kept doing what you guys were doing, I could get sober. You see, when Bill uh, went and talked with Bob, and Bob was going to give him 15 minutes, they talked for four, four or five hours. And when I came into AA, y'all did the same thing to me. Y'all sat right across the table from me and said, this is what happened to me, and you didn't tell me nothing about me. Nobody said, hey, Dale, you know, hell, I heard about that, Rick. You're a bad drunk. You need some help. Nobody said that. They said, you know what? I had one of them tell me, said, you know, you might be a candidate. <laughs> well, the closest I come to joining up. <laughs> but um, they would tell me that. They'd say, um, they'd say uh, this is what happened to me, and then I could take it or leave it. You know? Nobody forced anything on me. And that's what was sold me on this program. And so I decided I'd stay around for a while and, and, and you know, and just see if things got any better. And I'd already put the A word on me. You know, the reason I didn't pick up that white chip is because I didn't want AA. I, I felt like if I picked up that white chip, there was going to be two A's tattooed on my forehead. So I was going to walk around with AA stamped on me. And look at him. He's an AA. He's different. That's not what it was. What's happened to me is, look at him, he's in AA. Man, he sure has cleaned up. He's been doing good lately. You know, and, and things started getting better. So um, every day I, I joined the kitchen group down there and this God thing was worrying me a little bit. You know, um, I'd been a member of the church that I was in over there. Uh, I transferred my letter from the Methodist Church in Raleigh, Hayes Barton Methodist Church in Raleigh, to uh, down here to the Wrightsville Beach 
uh, Methodist Church, Harb Island, and um, and I moved it. I moved it there, and and I'd been a member, but I was a C and E Christian. You all know what that is, huh? Christmas and Easter. Christmas and Easter. That's it. <laughs> I went on Christmas and Easter whether I needed to or not. Sometimes I'd be smelling pretty high. <laughs> but um, I had been a member of a church, and I had this thing in my mind like uh, you get married, you buy a house, you get a white picket fence, a cat, a dog, and two kids, and you're participating in life. You know, And that's what I'd thought all my life. And church was not important to me. It just wasn't important. So um, after I got in there for a while, uh, they said, you're going to have to find a power greater than yourself that can relieve your problem. And boy, that was a bad crossroads for me. It was bad. So um, I said, what am I going to do? I talked to my sponsor. My sponsor was Chris P. He's dead now and gone. Uh, but Chris told me, he says, you know, he says, uh, you know, you don't have to take the God of the churches, you know. You can let it be a group of drunks, a G-O-D, group of drunks. How about the kitchen group? They're sober and you're drunk. So I let the kitchen group be my high power down at Rice Beach for the first three months. I'd get up in the morning, he'd tell me, now when you get up in the morning, you ask your high power to give you the power to stay sober and direct your thinking because it needs some direction. I said, okay. And I'd wake up and I'd have my hands across me, kind of like a corpse. I wouldn't get on my knees and lay in that bed and I'd say, whatever it is up there, how about keeping me sober and direct my thinking? Amen. And then I'd look out the window to see if anybody had seen this crazy fool in there <laughs> talking to the air. Um, you know, um, I, sometimes when I tell that, I tell it because people relate to it. But sometimes I'm ashamed to say that I did like that. <laughs> because I've been praying so long now, I wouldn't do without it just like air. You know, I prayed before I came up here for my high power to give me the words to say to y'all, you know. And, and I don't know anything about anything except me and what experience I got and to pass on to y'all. And so um, I did that first, and then my high power changed as, as I went along, you know. Um, I've been here 22 years, and it took me... Uh, 12 years to ever go back and sit in a church and because I wanted to, not because I had to. It was kind of like AA. And when I went into that church and sat down because I wanted to, it was just like I was walking into AA. I mean, when I sat on that pew, I felt like, you know, I'm, I felt like a misfit. You know, I just don't fit here. You know, and I sat there. And what happened to me was I'd had enough AA in me to where every sermon that the, that the preacher would give, it would sound like an AA sermon. You know what I mean? And this guy was an avid fan of AA because my preacher's father had been in AA. You know what I mean? And so it's just, I mean, God just put stuff together that you just wouldn't believe. He would just put it together. And so I went in there and talked with the preacher one day. I said, look, I said, I'm trying to come back to the church. You know, I said, I've been really interested in your services. And he said, uh, he said, um, I want you to come on back. He said, my father was in AA, and I told him about myself and everything and talked with him for a while, and he was a pretty nice guy. And he would kid with me and joke with me. He does to this day little things. Uh, he'll, he kid and joke with me. He said, did you take up the money today? And I said, yeah, I took the money up. He said, do you have any big bills in there? I said, two hundreds. <laughs> and then he'd say, did you put them in there? Or did you? Uh, no, I didn't mess with them. <laughs> You know, but I mean, they kid around in there. I mean, those old starchy people I didn't want to hang around with, they kid just like we do in AA, you know? And so um, I got to where I like church too. And so what it has done, AA's done for me, is day by day, little by little, has given me the experience to overcome things that I thought I didn't want to do. Just day by day, just little teeny things, you know? Does that make me goody goody two shoes going to church? No, it doesn't. But I felt like that maybe I was missing something there. I didn't know anything about AA, and I was definitely missing something in my life until I got here in AA. So if I can come in here and not like it, then maybe I can go into church and, and not like it. And so I've done that. Um, that turned into us uh, starting a home group there. We moved it from across the street to, 
to my church down there, uh, Beginners and Winners, and we've been there for about, about six, seven years now. And um, if you ever get down there, Thursday nights, 8 o'clock, come see us. And um, I remember going through the experience when we started that group. Uh, I remember going through it, and, um, and he said, no, we, we've had a, a NA group here for years. Said we want we want an AA group. Said I just didn't think anybody was going to ever ask. It was like he was waiting for him to ask him, ask him. He says I said well how much rent do, you, do we need to pay y'all? I said you know we ain't got. He said oh you ain't got to pay us nothing. But I knew better, you know. Traditions. I mean you got to pay. You know I said well we got to pay you something. He said well you just figure it out. So he, they invited us in and told us to figure it out. You know, so we started off by buying them like four chairs a month for the new building they were building, you know, and, and we just swap the chairs for rent and then we uh, give them uh, X amount of dollars at the end of the month. And they just let us in really cheap, really cheap. And it's a it's a brand new million dollar facility. It's like this place is very, very nice, you know, and so um, we've been elated about that. Um, I'd like to get in, I'd like to tell y'all a little something about sponsorship. I couldn't have ever got sober without sponsorship, you know. Uh, my sponsor, he was a happy-go-lucky guy, just like Steve was talking about, you know. And, and you know what? When I was in the bar, I always wanted to drink and laugh. I did not want to sob and cry about something. I'd see some of them down at the end of the bar, hoo, hoo, hoo. I'd get away from them, you know what I mean? They play the slowest, saddest country song they could put on the jukebox. And I'd say, man, we got to liven this thing up. You know, I'd take over the jukebox. And, um, but when I came in here, this sitting around and crying, I mean, I didn't get sober to have a veil of tears, but I did not know how to be happy in AA, you know? I thought when I came in here, my life was kind of sort of over. You know, and so I started going with these different people, not to just meetings like we at tonight, but we started going to like uh, we go to gratitude retreat uh, down at Myrtle Beach. That's where I met Steve down there with uh, wasn't it with uh, Buddy? Yeah, uh, down at Myrtle Beach. I met these other people. Then we got it. We swap numbers and we call back and forth to each other. Are you going this year? Yeah, I'm going. Where are you staying? And we get into all that, and, and we just get into all kinds of mischief. And stuff, but it was good, clean fun, you know. And we laugh and carry on and have a great time. Everybody pick at everybody, you know, and all that. And I found out that it was not a glum lot. These people in AA. I mean, I had a lot of fun with them. And besides that, I could get up the next morning and remember it, you know. <laughs> you know what he said last night? No, I said well, I do, you know. So the thing is this. You come in here and you have to grow up and learn how to adjust your life to people that, that drink and drink normally, you know? It was a year until I went to my first pig picking. I went to that with all my buddies that I fished with on, on the boat. I love to go do those uh, marlin tournaments and stuff. And we go three or four weeks a year. We started uh, Carolina Beach, you know, then we go up to Moorhead, and then we do the one at uh, Wrightsville Beach, and then sometimes we go to Georgetown, South Carolina, and do that one. We had one guy that was rich that had the boat, and we'd help buy the fuel, you know, and that would break us up. But um, when we did all that fishing and everything, I, we'd chip in, buy that fuel, and I'd say, well, I'm going to buy them up. If I win this tournament, there's a blah, blah, blah money, and my part's going to be $38,000. I'm going to be rich after we get finished with this tune, you know. And um, the first year I came into AA, I had a choice to make. Being March 18th is my sobriety date, and the tournament's starting in May. You know, I had a month and a half. Of, of not drinking, not sobriety, of not drinking, and then all the tournaments were going to start. Now, the guys that I fish with, they all, all of those guys, they drank and, and passed out and stuff. So I remember I called up uh, Jimmy. I called him up in Richmond. He's the guy that owned the boat. 
that I was supposed to go with him. He'd asked me six months before to go with him, and it was an honor, really. He bought a brand new Viking sport fisherman. It was beautiful. And I just couldn't wait to ride on that boat, go out there and go. It was going to be great. I was all excited about it, and then I got this drunk driving ticket in the hospital, you know, with all that. Then I had to come into AA, and th well, things just weren't going good to go fishing. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> the things just weren't going in the right direction. So I had a decision to make, and I remember I talked with my sponsor. I said, listen, I go fishing every year with these guys. Been doing it 15 years and don't intend to not do it this year. And he said, that's great, Dad. You can go. If you want to get drunk, go ahead. <laughs> I'd say, this guy doesn't understand. If I put all my might and power behind it, I won't drink. He said, ain't going to happen. <laughs> and, uh, and so I thought about that thing, and I said, you know, those AAs haven't told me anything wrong yet. So I think maybe I'll see if I can pass this up. So I called him up that night, and he told me, he said, oh, Dale, it's okay. You don't have to drink. With us, I said, well, I've gotten in a world of trouble with my drinking. I got a DWI. I got bandages on my head. I said, I need to stay down here in AA. I don't need to be going fishing with y'all. He said, well, you don't have to drink. He said, we'll drink. You ain't got to drink. And I see me right now in the back of that boat drinking Kool-Aid <laughs> a month sober. You know what I mean? It ain't going to happen. You know, and I got honest with Dale down in here. And I said, uh, I, I just can't do it, man. I hung that phone up, and I, I can't tell you how bad I felt. I was really kind of sad about that. But I look back on it, and that wreck was a, was a monumental milestone in my life. That not going to that tournament was another milestone in my sobriety. You know, and so I was creeping forward. I was going in the right direction. You know they won that tournament. $30,000 was my cut if I'd have gone um, I was on the computer the other night um, looking up some mess on the computer and I went to the uh, Big Rock tournament a uh, big rock uh, fishing tournament, and it showed all the past winners, and there it was, 1991, when I got sober. Locomotion, that was the name of the boat. Locomotion. And uh, it won the tournament that year. But um, I look back on that, I wouldn't trade my sobriety for no 30,000. Wouldn't trade it for 130 or 330. You know? Yeah, I mean, there ain't no money. Money don't fit in on my sobriety. So, uh, I look at these things as monumental steps in my life. You know, um, what saved me uh, through all this stuff is, is sponsorship. It's kept me involved. Um, <clears throat> I tend to have a way of bringing stuff out that's just really simple. And a lot of people come up to me, and I don't know why they do it, but they'll say, you know, I, I could kind of get that because it was simple. You know, and so I guess that keep it simple is, is really correct. Keep it simple. And so um, that's the way I've done AA since I've been here. I've tried to keep it simple. You know, if you don't drink, you don't get drunk. You know, it's just simple. And, um, and how do I go about not drinking to keep from getting drunk? Well, I'm going to help that guy because when I'm thinking about that guy, I ain't thinking about this guy. You know, and so that's. That's the way AA is, is fitted into my life, you know. Um, I wouldn't trade, I wouldn't trade every, every moment I've had that was bad for anything uh, in this program. The bad moments I had was what was necessary for me to get here, you know. Um, another moment in my life was when, uh, when my daughter gave me a CD for Christmas from the Hawaiian State Convention, you know. And I said, where'd you get this? She said, at the convention. I said, what were you doing there? She said, Dad, I've been in AA for a year and a half. That was another milestone in my life. You know, um, there's lots of people. Uh, I had nothing to do with AA works just fine, you know. I ain't got to grab nobody and get them sober. You know, when they've had enough, they'll come in. Or they'll die. And uh, I'm grateful I didn't die in that wreck that night. I could have, you know. Um, 
I always like to speak about my wife here. My wife has been my best supporter in this deal. In October the 29th of the year 2000, she had a stroke, and she lost her left side. We used to go camping with Nori and, and his wife and a lot of people in a group called the Co Coffee Cup Campers. And um, that meant that we drank out of coffee cups. We didn't drink out of cocktail glasses, you know? And, uh, and we'd ride around and meet all over the state in, uh, in our motorhomes, you know? So I bought a motorhome, I started motorhoming. And when she had that stroke, we, she couldn't go anymore. And when she couldn't go, I couldn't go. And um, I still got that motorhome now, a 2,000 model motorhome with 15,000 miles on it, brand new, sitting in the garage. And um, I kept hoping day by day, week by week, month by month, that maybe she would get some mobility back, but she hasn't gotten any of it back. And so we kind of let the chips fall where the chips fall, you know. But um, AA has kept me busy during all this. I've been so disgusted, mad, and fed up. I mean, you know, I, I'm not one to nurse anybody, you know. Um, but I learned how to, uh, to clean my wife up when she had accidents. I learned how to do all that stuff that I didn't want to do. But I did it because I was sober. There ain't no telling what I'd done if I'd have been drunk. Um, she stays at home now. We got three girls that work there, stay there around the clock, you know, and uh, and we're making, um, well, we're taking lemons and trying to make lemonade is what we're doing. And um, I always enjoy the opportunity to come up here and see all you guys up here. Y'all got a great group. This is a great group up here, you know. Uh, Steve, I'd like to thank you for asking me up here, and I'm going to kind of end it up now because I think I've said about all I have to say. Thank you all for letting me share.